Welcome back to the Black Health Lit Podcast. This is a space where we can be black, proud, and healthy. As a reminder, the information shared here is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. While you're here, check out the episode description to learn more about today's guest and shop Black Proud Healthy merch. When you shop merch, you're helping to support future episodes and free health education for the Black Health Lit community. Lastly, make sure you like, subscribe, and share this episode. All right, welcome back to the Black Health Lit Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Ray Crowder, and today I have the pleasure of talking with Representative Latina Humphrey. Before we get into today's topic, please tell my audience a little bit about yourself. Well, absolutely. First of all, thank you um, for having me here today. As was stated, I am Representative uh, Latina Humphrey. I have the pleasure of representing Ohio's uh, second house district. So East Columbus, City of Whitehall, and then parts of those uh, little surrounding cities. Um, but I'm a state representative. I am in my what some would say my official first term, but technically my second term. I was appointed in uh, 2021 and then officially elected in 2022. So I say my second term. Um, I'm a mom. He is my son is 11. His name is Jordan. Um, I am an author, a two time author. Nice. Um, I'm from the city of Columbus, grew up on the near east side, uh, very different from the east side of Columbus, uh, graduated, I think I said from East High School, Champion Middle, Franklin, okay. um, University of Columbus State. So Columbus born and bred and um, just I love what I do and I love people. Awesome. Thank you so much for being Absolutely. here and sharing a little bit about yourself. So what does a typical day look like for a state representative? Oh, man. Um, so right now we're on summer break, so it's a lot more ease. Um, but I will say, you know, during session and things like that, it's very busy. You have. Com well, first of all, you have committee hearings and you have um, uh, meetings. You typically have meetings before you have committee hearings. Committee hearings last hours, and that's where you talk about potential bills. Then you have se session, and then you have caucus, caucus, and then it's just it's very busy. And then after you're done in a state house, you have a lot of uh, community things to do as well. So okay, yeah, and the community things are the things that we get to see. So yeah. we don't often see what you're doing when you're in the legislation piece of it. But when you go from legislation into the community, that's what we get to see. And uh, that's oftentimes what the community judges our representatives on. Yeah. And you do a lot in the community. Yeah, I've been watching to. you for quite some time. Um, so I know that there are obstacles with everything in life. What are some of the biggest obstacles for a state rep like yourself and how do you overcome them? Yeah, so some of the um, obstacles that I face as a state representative is the fact that I like to be uh, very involved in my community. However, as a state legislator, you are almost like an individual entity. So I like to throw events. I like to do different things, but I'm backed by one person. And that is, you know, my campaign funds. If people don't give, I can't do what I need um, to do in the community. So like city council or the city has departments so they can fund right. certain things. County has the ability to do certain things because they have a funding source. Source. The state legislature is not like that. If I think of an idea, it has to be funneled by myself. And so that is one of the biggest challenges because I do see um, the opportunities. But um, because of that, it kind of makes it difficult. OK, yeah, you can't do a lot without the money. Right. Yeah. And I didn't uh, have that understanding yeah. that you all had to have your own fund to be able to put the programs mm -hmm. in place and make the difference. Well, well um, engaging engagement okay. and, uh, as far as engagement. Yes. Uh, but we do have the ability to fund uh, sort certain organizations or put money behind um, entities or programs, literal programs that help people. But as far as like engagement, yeah, we have to back that ourselves. Wow. OK, that's a lot of work. Yeah, that is a lot of work. Yeah. What do you think about are some of the most pressing? We're switching to the, the topic of health now. Yeah. What do you think are some of the most pressing health issues in the community right now? Yeah. So when you think about 
Um, so in my district specifically, it's predominantly uh, African American, but more than anything, it is the most diverse district in Franklin County. And so um, when you talk about issues, I think that there are a number of areas of opportunity. I always like to say that because issues sound uh, sounds like an issue, right? Yeah. Uh, but um, what I would say is that um, you have a, a number of people who are under uh, insured, health insured. Yeah. You have um, in certain communities in my district, district specifically, there are not a lot of health care facilities in the first place yeah. to service people. You have um, lots of credit. Our dis- my district specifically in a lot of black communities are targeted more so with predatory lending than they are, um, you know, banks to actually help people and put people in position um more you know um i I think when you when you think about it you 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 see that there are more liquor stores and bodegas and markets more than there are um you know uh, real grocery stores in my district the largest grocer left right and 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 for good reason you know i have to be honest about that but that leaves a food desert and so um they're they're real they're real issues and and they're more beyond that mental health issues substance abuse issues you know so yeah Definitely. And you talked a little bit about the food deserts. There's also the food swamps. So you have the liquor stores, you have corner stores and the marketing in itself is, you know, a big old liquor bottle across the building. And you may pay just two dollars for a banana at a corner store, but you don't have access to a regular grocery store. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's talk about solutions. What are some of the programs and resources that are available for people who live who are living in these areas with food deserts, food swamps, lack of resources? So um, as far as uh, as far as that's concerned, it is really about investment. What um, who is what stakeholder is really willing to invest in a community more than it is programming um and so and i guess you could not say more than it is but in a sense it's who's willing to be a stakeholder in the community who's willing to take a risk if you will to be in the community and so where we come into play is when entities like the mid ohio food collective come to us and say listen we see that there are issues we see that it's a food desert food swamp in this specific area kroger was just here on refugee road in uh, hamilton and they're now gone but yeah. we believe that we have um a plan to essentially service the community just like and this is this is real life thing just like they've done like we've done in uh grove city and so we would like to come to the east side of columbus and do the same thing drive through uh, uh where folks can get food where uh in that building they would have a pharmaceutical companies where they would also are not pharmaceutical but they would have a pharmacy also would have a partnership with primary one and all these different things it's about who is willing to be a stakeholder yeah. and then if they have their stuff in order us as the state me as a state legislator specifically my job is to then try to support them through funding opportunities that the state provides whether it's one-time strategic funds which is a once in a lifetime thing or capital budget dollars where i have to advocate and say listen you know i would like for them to have five hundred thousand dollars and also understanding that it goes beyond advocating for funding um uh through these uh these uh, processes that the state provides, Mm. but it it means going to talk to people who really are the power players behind the capital budget process, the one-time strategic funds, i.e. the Columbus partnership. And that's one of the things I've done is we've got this ability, but prior to that, I know I need to talk to the people who are really in control because it's not us. Let's, let's be clear. It's, it's not us. And we have to be honest about that. And so, um, that's some of the things that I've been able to do, but it's about who's willing to be a stakeholder. If they're willing to really, really, really be a stakeholder, then how can I support them be be the best that they can be? Yeah. So what we're seeing is stakeholders don't necessarily want to take risks in certain communities. And when they do, it's our job to support them. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent explanation. Going back to food deserts and um, 
lack of resources yeah so there are social determinants of health right uh, and uh, that's what prompted me to contact you you yeah. you were speaking on social determinants of health and for my audience that's really all of the things that are outside of your clinical needs so yeah. it's your housing it's your right. access to education mm-hmm. food finances transportation uh-huh. all of those things that feed into your ability or your opportunity to be healthy right So why is it important for people like yourself, clergy and other community members to be well versed on social determinants of health? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And and I'll say because people who are actually first of all, we are impacted by the social determinants of health. That's number one. But what we have to understand is that people are going to come to us that are really, really, really touched by the social determinants of health. And we want to be more than a lip servant. We want to provide more than lip service. And so Mm -hmm. if we're not uh, keenly aware of the issues, we can't serve. I always say, if I'm not in my community, if I'm not touching people, if I'm not watching what's happening, I can't help you. Same for clergy. People are going to come, one, to be spiritually fed, but they also know there's a possibility if I need resources for housing or whatever else, or food, fresh produce or whatever, I know that I can come to you. Um, and uh, if we're not if we're not in a position to understand how things are uh, in a sh- uh, cor- in, in correlation to one another, we can't serve people. And so we all need to be aware of the social determinants of health and then we also need to make sure that we're connected in a way uh, to really provide resources. And it's hard. It, it is. It is. It's very hard to do uh, because uh, you know there there are limited funding sources to really help people. And then ultimately, if we want to help people, you got to be darn near really poor in order to receive those funds. So yeah. it, it is frustrating, but we need to be aware of the social determinants of health for sure. Absolutely. And you made a good point about people pretty much have to be in crisis uh, yeah. before receiving health uh, um, help a lot of times, which is unfortunate. And um, there are opportunities to prevent people from going into crisis. Yeah. And we miss those as a society a lot of times. Yeah. Council member Bankston said something very uh, unique. And I, I heard him say this, I believe, uh, last year. He said, oftentimes people come to me when it's already too late. Yeah. Um, and that is that's real. They come to you when it's too late. And, and you said people come to you or the only time we, we can sometimes help is when people are in crises. Yep. Uh, but the reality is, is even when they're in crises, because I experience all the time, it's like, oh, my God, I can't do anything. Yeah. And that's frustrating as well. Yeah. Let's focus in on housing, okay. which is one of the social determinants of right. health and housing affordability throughout Franklin County is a major issue as right. we continue to grow. Right. How do you think housing is impacting the health uh, specifically for black Americans throughout Franklin County? Ooh, um, I think that's causing a lot of mental strain. OK, um, because it's housing is like your number one need because mm-hmm. you you want to have that sense of home. You want to have that sense of security and safety. Uh, and when you're at risk of being put out of your home or when you don't have access to be put in your home into a home, you are mentally stressed out because you don't want to depend on other people and other people mm-hmm. don't want to depend on you or help as much they want to help but not as much as you may need the help put it that way um and it 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 causes a lot of mental anguish and i know folks people reach out to my office who work a lot and can't still can't afford uh market rate rent and i think it's what uh fifteen sixteen hundred dollars that for for a two-bedroom yeah. In a decent neighborhood. That's the key. You want safe, accessible, and quality housing. You just don't want to live any aware. Yeah. And um that that's an issue. And and I think that it it, it impacts health in a lot lots of ways, but I think it it really touches first to the mental. 
Of course. I can agree yeah. with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. The yeah. mental health. And you talked about that a little bit at the beginning, the the mental health of your district. Yeah. And that's a nationwide issue right yeah. now is mental yeah. health challenges. And having access to housing can be one of the things that can help somebody to move towards yeah. better mental well-being. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about future plans. This okay. is a huge election year. Yeah. And I know yeah. we say that every four years. Yeah. Yeah. But seriously, this year is, I think, unlike anything we've ever seen before. Right. And as a state representative, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to in, after this upcoming election? Well, I... Listen, I, I'm go, I gotta say this because this is important. I think your viewers need to hear this, especially Take it when, away. <laughs> when you, you talk about this upcoming presidential election. We are not looking for a savior. We are not looking for a Valentine. We're looking for a experienced, qualified adult to run the United States of America and ultimately be the most powerful person in the world right yeah. uh and so we're not we're, we're not looking for anything other than that so do i think that there's still going to be issues should uh the vice president become the pres the the president of the united states absolutely yeah. still going to be issues there's still going to be uh crime it's still going to have people who struggle with small businesses we're still going to see areas that need to be improved there's yeah. no doubt about it but we will see if um you know our vice president does become president we will see active change to try to address those things will it happen overnight no so i i'll say that i am excited because there will be someone in the white house who is actively fighting every single day to improve our lives but also understand overwhelmingly because i am a politician whether people like to say the, the word or not yeah. and no change happens overnight it's not with the flick of the wrist or a snap of the finger like it, it, it there it, we're still going to go through some things but um I, I'm excited to see a transition in power of a qualified adult. Not to say uh, that our current president is not, um, he's amazing. Stats shows one of the best presidents of our lifetime. But I think um, that, that I'm not going to say we won't see change. We will see change, but yeah. I'm not the person to think that it's going to be sunshine and rainbows on January 20th. Yeah. I, I just don't, I don't believe that. I appreciate that honest yeah. answer because I think some people think, yeah. well, we need a light switch solution, something yeah. quick, fast, and in a hurry. Yeah. And I like that you are grounding us in reality yeah. that is progress, yeah. not perfection. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. That's good. You ready for some rapid fire questions? Sure. All right. So what does wellness mean to Representative Humphrey? Wellness means physical wellness, like you're okay, you know, you're getting the services you need and and you feel you feel pretty good. But also I think like a mental mental health is uh is important and plays a part. Yeah. and all of that um just holistic approaches all of that so I, I just i think wellness means that your mind body and spirit is almost in alignment because nothing is perfect but it's yeah. almost in alignment and you have some harmony there and you feel pretty darn okay pretty darn okay yeah. i like that let's talk about health literacy so okay. i've had a lot of people think that health literacy is the ability to read because uh -huh. of the word the use of the word literacy, literacy yeah. but really it's it's more than that it's the ability to not only read the information but understand it yeah and then apply it to your life yes yeah, so cool. uh, understanding what your doctor is saying, understanding what preventative health is, understanding why it's important you have access to those healthy fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think black health literacy specifically is important? Uh, because um, if we have health literacy, we live longer. Like that's mm -hmm. just the reality. If we have an understanding of how certain foods impact our bodies, impact our minds, mm -hmm. 
um, how certain chemicals and certain foods impact us. And we start understanding that and really kind of listening to our doctors and listening to doctors who actually have an understanding of the black body. I think that that's yeah. important. Um, you know, I, the longer we're going to live, the healthier we'll be, the, the more we'll be able to stick around for our kids and hopefully our grandkids and so on. So yeah. health literacy is is really, really important. But again, it, it, it's, it's a determinant as to how long we live. For it sure. definitely is. There is a direct connection yeah. between Facts. health literacy Facts. and health outcomes Facts. for Facts. sure for Facts. sure so if people want to continue to follow your work yeah uh, as a state representative and see the work that you're doing to address social determinants of yeah. health in your district and beyond where can people follow you and keep up with your work so I always give LinkedIn, but I really don't post on there. But um, <laughs> okay. I just I accept people and stuff like that. Like I'm on there. I just don't post. Uh, but Latina M. Humphrey, Facebook, Latina M. Humphrey, Instagram, where I'm the most active. You can kind of see my day to day activities at Rep. Latina M. Humphrey. And uh, yeah, that's that's how you find me. Also, you can Google me and reach out to my office um, and my staff will get back to you. And yeah. Um, you can send a message there if you have questions about legislation. It doesn't even have to be mine. Reach out so I can, you know, make that connection. Perfect. Thank you yeah, for that. Yeah. I appreciate you being Absolutely. here today. Thank Absolutely. you so much Absolutely. for coming in, sharing you. your wisdom and experience. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you.